Yeah, so in 1983, March of 1983, um, I was the chief engineer of the research vessel Aloha, and we did underwater exploration. It was like my dream job. I got to combine diving with engineering and, you know, it was everything that I, I wanted in a job. We had just evaluated a new um, remote operated submarine, an ROV, and we, um, there was a storm off the California coast and we were trying to beat the storm into our harbor and the harbor master wouldn't allow the ship in because there were 25, 30 foot breakers at the breakwater at the mm -hmm. harbor entrance. And so um, they just, you know, the captain kept the ship uh, about two miles off, off the coast, away from the breaker zones and everything. And, um, but we had folks on board that needed to um, get into LAX. And so we, uh, not we, the captain and, and part of the crew that needed to be relieved and needed to get get back and and one of them was one of the design engineers for this new rov we were evaluating we uh we loaded them up in a rubber zodiac i don't know if you know what that is but you see the 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 marines use it to for landings and stuff like that it's like a rubber boat we loaded it up and the captain said asked me i was the chief engineer and i normally don't leave the ship once we're out to sea but um i was third officer and the second officer wasn't on this trip because it was just an evaluation trip. So no one else knew the harbor like I did. So of the crew that we had. So the captain asked if I would, if I'd go along and, and go in with one of the mates and we would bring them into shore and then we'd bring the Zodiac back out. And so um, I agreed. We, we took a bearing, we went up and checked the radar and everything because it was it was it was a stormy night it, you know dark and stormy night kind of like you know um so you know it was hard visibility wasn't that great we took a bearing using radar and we could see the harbor buoy flashing every once in a while whenever it was up on the top of the swell we could see the harbor buoy so we figured okay that's our target so we got in the boat we started heading in on our way in we would go up on a swell, take a bearing on where the harbor buoy was, then we'd go down that, that swell and up the next one and do it over again. But <laughs> it wasn't very long that the storm had blown us way off course and we couldn't find the harbor buoy, but the shoreline was lit up. It's California coast, you know, it was lit up. So we uh, we figured, well, worst case, we'll just do a beach landing and we'll get this these guys to the harbor somehow, some way so they can get back to, you know, they can get, you know, make their connections. So we start heading in and uh, it wasn't very long. <laughs> we ran into, we were about a mile offshore still and we ran into a breaker zone. And the, how we found out is we drove right off a 30 footer and crashed down and i yelled to the mate because i was in the bow trying to navigate trying to see our way and um <clears throat> i yelled to the mate who was at the center console i told him you know turn us about and uh and and let's we're a lot safer out to sea than we are here in this breaker zone the next one was right above our head it came crashing down it folded the zodiac in half like a peanut butter sandwich i was in the bow it catapulted me into the sea and and most of the guys got squeezed out into the ocean but i'm a i'm a trained commercial diver i've spent thousands of hours underwater it's not a you know it wasn't a you know wasn't something that i was freaked out about and this night we'd actually gone down the bosun's locker and got out uh, life vests so i was actually wearing a life vest which is one of the few times that we wore life vests i'm hanging on to may west and i'm thinking okay and i'm just you know protecting myself and because who knows what else is in the water being tumbled and tossed and so and i couldn't you know i'm a, i know how to i know how to survive underwater so i you know i tried blowing out some bubbles but there was no visibility so and it was at night so you couldn't see anything it was dark stormy and um they teach us in diver training actually you know that euphoria of oxygen deprivation and everything and so i had gone through that i recognized what it was but then eventually you breathe in salt water and i drowned i found myself immediately in this blackness 
the roar of the ocean was gone. The cold of the ocean, this is March in, on the California coast. The water comes out of the north. It's very cold water. Um, I wasn't cold. I wasn't, it wasn't loud anymore. It was quiet. It was peaceful. But it was absolute blackness. And I felt suspended in this blackness. But I didn't feel like I was alone. It felt like there was this greater presence with me. I didn't know what it was, but it, it was, I was very curious. And I was really curious because it was like, this is way beyond my training. <laughs> Eventually I saw this, it started out as just this pinpoint of light, but it, but in, in that vast thick blackness, it just, um, you know, it catches your attention. And I don't know if I went toward the light or the light came toward me. There was no tunnel or anything like that. It was just movement toward this light and the light kept getting, growing bigger and bigger. And as it got, as I got closer, I realized it was millions upon millions of fragments of light and they were all moving and they had this unity to them. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen like a school of uh, sardines or anchovies when they, they swirl around and they all kind of like move and flash. It was totally captivating. And as I got closer, I started feeling these waves and waves of love like I've never, ever felt before. I had a very dysfunctional you know, childhood and so never felt this warmth and this love that I was feeling coming off of this light. And three fragments broke away and they came toward me. And when they came toward me, they were welcoming me home. And that is the thing that really gets to me every time I, I talk about this is the welcoming home. And, it, and I recognize these light, these lights as, as other beings. And I recognize they felt like family to me, unlike any kind of family that I had in this physical life. And so eventually a dozen of them came greeting me, welcoming me and and loving me when we when we leave our body our vision is altered it's actually amplified greatly and so this was um I, it was like eyes it was like i could see the eyes of this being and i knew who they were and they could see my eyes and they knew who i was and so um they felt like family they felt more like family and they were welcoming me home and they communicated to me that we were going into the light, deeper into the light. And we went to this area to me that felt like a giant sphere. And inside this giant sphere, we, I started to relive my life. And when I say I relive my life, it was more like um, I re-experienced everything, but not just from my perception, but from everyone and everything that I'd ever interacted with. And I was seeing my life through this new panorama. And so I got to see some of the, the less savory parts of my life. I also got to see some of the parts of my life that where I would do something with, with loving intention without, without looking for anything. And those moments created some of the biggest ripples. In other words, every time we do something, we, we, we create, we set energy in motion and this energy affects other people, whether we realize it or not. And, and so I got to see how my actions and interactions with people affected other people and through their eyes and through their perception and through their feelings. So it was, uh, it was very humbling. It was incredibly humbling, but I got to see, you know, kind of, you know, if we, if we, add judgment to it, you get to see the good and the bad. Um, but there was no judgment there. And my family was experiencing it with me at the same time, just as I was experiencing it. And they had no judgment. They were just loving me and supporting me through the whole thing. It's kind of interesting in the life review, everything that I had lived was absolutely crystal clear. And the interactions and the perceptions from all the people I'd interacted with and all the things that I'd, I'd done was absolutely crystal clear. I got to a point where I had gone past my death and, and 
then it was it wasn't as clear it's kind of interesting it was like looking down a corridor the center of the corridor was was very clear but then there was this periphery that was like you know just a little out of focus and so i started down this this corridor and i started experiencing my future at the time i didn't realize what it was but i started having these experiences that i didn't have a reference for in this life but i reached a certain point where the light itself you gotta remember you're inside this sphere with you know that ripples outward but it ripples outward into the light and the light is surrounding you all these and the light itself spoke it said this is not your time you must return and i perceived that light those millions upon millions of fragments of, of light as god and god is telling me this is not my time i must return and I said, no way, because I'm I'm loved like I've never felt love before. And um, I'm and my body is in that water. It is just I hate this. I don't want to sound crude, but it was cold meat and I just didn't want anything to do with it. And uh, <laughs> the light spoke one more time. It said, you must return. You have a purpose. And that word purpose just resonated through my being. And when you're out of your body and you're you're going through this process we call death, you have this expansive awareness that is like you're connected to every soul that ever was and every soul that ever will be. So you have this capacity of knowing so much more than what we, we have available to us in this physical sense. And so with that expanded um, consciousness, when I heard purpose, it resonated through me and I understood it. And it was so simple and so, so efficient. It was like, you could, you could not agree. You could just could not agree. I mean, disagree. The minute I accepted that purpose, I found myself outside my body. My body's still in the ocean, being tumbled and tossed. And the three original light beings that greeted me, the soul family that greeted me, were with me. They were actually slightly behind me. And, um, and we're watching my body as it's still being, you know, tumbled and lifelessly being tumbled and tossed around. And some of the wreckage from the Zodiac, actually the bow line came down and it, it came down and it wrapped itself around my arm. And the bitter end of the bow line was, was tapping my, my chest. And I'm observing this from outside my body. I'm observing and I'm thinking, how? am I going to fit in there? And just about then is when another set of waves hit some of the wreckage and the wreckage must have had some more air in one of the pontoons and it jer jerked that line up. And when it did, it cinched around this arm, pulled my arm, actually dislocated my arm and my thumb and pulled my body up to the surface where it got entangled around the Zodiac, this pontoon and another set of waves hit me and it forced some of the salt water up. And that's when my soul family gave me a gentle push and I found myself just vibrated right back into my body. And it wasn't comfortable because the, the body was in, a, in bad shape and we're still a mile offshore in this breaker zone that I was caught in and I'm throwing up salt water. It wasn't a pretty sight. I couldn't speak, but I heard my name. I heard my name being called because the other guys that were in the Zodiac were now, these are some brave guys. They stayed in this breaker zone to gather together. And this is something that we kind of learned when, you know, when we're in trouble, we, we come together and we, we, we make sure everybody's all right. And, um, and so they were looking for me and one of them had somehow hung on to a flashlight. And so they're sweeping the ocean with this flashlight, but they were calling my name and I, and I'm hanging on to the wreckage and, um, to stay up and, and I couldn't speak cause I, you know, I breathed in all this salt water. I, but I was able to make some squeaks and squawks and they were able to finally find me and they all swam over. We hung on to the wreckage and we swam. One of the guys popped my shoulder back in and, um, and, and I, I popped my thumb back in and, and we picked up the wreckage of the Zodiac and we found our way up to the road and, and
and back to the harbor and everything. I didn't feel like I could share it with my mates that were with me. And when they asked me, they said, Dave, you were gone a long time. Like they were thinking like 15 to 18 minutes is what they estimated. And I know I can hold my breath for a maximum of three because I had, being a diver, you, you, your lungs tend to expand. And so I called that acceptance. I had learned acceptance of myself and who I was, but I also had learned tolerance and, and tolerance of other people and their past because I saw how in that life review, our interactions, we have, uh, you know, we, we all have our own paths and that um, I may not agree with your path or where you're, what you're doing, but I can accept that that's your choice and that's your life that you're living. I found that there's a higher truth, a truth that resonates within each and every one of our hearts. That's our personal truth. It kind of woke me up that I have to really accept the whole package. I don't feel like I have to tell everybody about my near-death experience, but I can live by what I've learned in that near-death experience.